Estou aqui montando o um episódio que ia sem ser essa semana a outra, mas está estourando essa situação na Síria e eu achei que era melhor antecipar. War is extraordinarily good for business, and Syria is the best business in town. Aqui é minha ilha de edição, tem uma galera na produtora que eu sou sócio, SP Filmes montando também. A gente trabalha meio em equipe, em nuvem. Aqui o roteiro do meu próximo longa, aqui os cartões com as coisas que eu gravo. E, bom, vou mostrar como tá ficando a edição pra vocês. O episódio tá ficando assim, a gente abriu com o Rambo, ó. Arma é um negócio que dá aquela sensação de poder, né? Todo mundo gosta, todo mundo quer atirar, fica com a sensação que tá poderoso, como se estivesse num filme. Mas não é sobre esse lado das armas que a gente vai falar hoje. Hoje nós vamos falar aqui sobre tudo que a indústria das armas quer esconder de você. Um lado que não querem que você saiba. Eu tenho um grande amigo que é o Robert Muga, que é um dos grandes especialistas em armas. Ele atuou na guerra do Iraque e Afeganistão com um desarmamento. Ele seguiu aquele cara que foi retratado no filme Senhor das Armas. O Rob foi até consultor do filme e vai dividir um pouco dessa experiência dele com a gente. Aí eu mandei uma mensagem pra ele e falei, Rob, a gente tem que antecipar o um episódio e falar sobre isso agora. As pessoas precisam saber. Aí ele mandou essa mensagem aqui. The fact is we've had World War 3 for a couple of years now. Syria is the world's most complex conflict. In fact, there are many conflicts underway in Syria. It all began back in 2011 really with a Arab Spring like uprising. Once that happened, a whole shitstorm began. You had the United States that began supporting a rebel group that formed from the resistance. You had the Russians coming in and supporting the Syrian government. But it got more complicated than that. Soon you had Al-Qaeda splitting off into another group that involved a group called ISIS, Islamic State. And they're basically fighting Assad, the Kurdish rebels to the north, the Americans and everybody in between. What that means is that the world's arms trade is salivating. You have literally thousands of different players who are pouring weapons in from all over the world. We're getting weapons now from Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina and Serbia that are being shipped into Syria by the Americans. You're getting weapons from Ukraine, Bulgaria and ex-Soviet states that are being shipped in by the Russians. Pedi pro Rob me dizer as coisas que são importantes colocar vocês sobre a guerra na Síria para ajudar a gente a olhar isso com de um jeito crítico. Então, por exemplo, só nesse mês foi a quarta vez que, foi utiliza que foram utilizadas armas químicas na Síria. Os Estados Unidos responderam com a ação do presidente Donald Trump mandando 59 mísseis Tomahawk. Parte do mundo apoiou, parte do mundo foi contra. Por quê? Muita gente diz que isso vai prevenir uma catástrofe, só que outros não falam que a catástrofe já estava acontecendo lá. O que está acontecendo na Síria não é, é, não é uma coisa rara, única, já aconteceu muitas vezes. Uma outra coisa importante, a maior parte da matança não envolveu armas de destruição em massa. E esse é o ponto do episódio de hoje. Vamos continuar. Eu estou mais baixo que ele, né? Tá. You're a little taller now. <laughs> Basically, guns are everywhere. But what's really strange is that we don't know a lot about their production, their trade, the rules governing their use, and we only know a little bit about just how much devastation they cause. But why do we walk through just some of the things we do know? The first thing to say is that it's, it's a small business, but it's a big trade. Every single country imports and exports guns. $8.5 billion is the legal trade. Ah, the legal in trade. all small arms and light weapons and ammunition. When you talk about ships and missiles and planes, and we're talking about trillions of dollars. Okay. But the stuff that actually kills most people are the handguns, uh -huh. the rifles, the bullets. The second point to say, virtually every single gun on the street begins its life legally. Whenever you see a gun, 99.9% of the time, it comes from a factory. The, the third thing to say is that there are many ways that guns find their way from the legal market into the illegal market through what's called diversion. You have a legal deal going from one country to another country. You'll have a dodgy police officer, a customs officer, somebody along the way who just makes a few guns disappear. Uh, just like on that scene from City of God, right? Right, exactly. Or you have these notorious dealers who are literally scouring the world, who are looking to rebuy stockpiles of guns and then resell them on the black market. And so the movie Lords of War, which stars character is Nicolas Cage, but it's actually based on a guy called Victor Bau, uh, who's a Russian arms dealer. That's all about a guy, one of many people, who basically started to dominate the illegal market for small arms and light weapons. So I spent the last 20 years or so basically tracking uh, the trade of, of arms. And along the way, I've come across a lot of less than salubrious characters uh, who are arms brokers or 
as they call themselves, defense contractors in the business. It sounds a little bit cleaner. <laughs> uh, Victor Bout, um, I never met the guy. I was spent a long time following him. Was one of the most celebrated of these arms dealers. He started out as a small time you know, crook, essentially, in the late 80s. He very quickly made deals where he would essentially take tens of thousands of AK-47s, RPGs, and then he would have a whole network where he would ship these guns into wars in Africa. So he captured the entire trade. In Rwanda, Goma, which is a city on the, the con in Congo, and parts of South Asia, he was everywhere. I mean, everywhere you went, you would see traces of Victor Bao. It wasn't just a question of rebels or guerrillas who were making these deals. Often it was governments, governments who essentially lacked the kind of legitimate credit to be able to buy weapons, who would go around the formal routes and go straight to people like Victor Bout. He was critical in terms of managing uh, the movement of weapons around the world. Uh, he finally got picked up uh, after a long investigation and was taken to the United States uh, to be charged. The Russians complained because this was a very important actor in their wider circuitry. Uh, of managing the movement of weapons around the world. You know, I think it would be wrong to assume these guys somehow operate autonomously, alone. They're all part of a very complex network involving governments, guerrillas, warlords, and others. At the end of the Cold War, when there were tons and tons and tons of stuff just lying around all over Eastern Europe, even today, if I were to travel to many of these countries, you could still literally find hangars full of stuff, surface air missiles, grenades, landmines, assault rifles, you name it. Stuff that's just gathering dust, getting rusty, sitting idle. Why? We only cared about the big stuff. Nuclear weapons, uh -huh. ballistic weapons, chemical weapons. Usually when you made a big arms deal, you'd throw in a couple of thousand small arms just as an extra bonus. But no one really wanted to track them. No one really cared because as far as they were concerned, that wasn't where the money was. It was only at the end of the Cold War that suddenly we stood up and said, wait a second, a lot of these wars around the world, a lot of the crime, most of them are being prolonged and sustained by the small stuff. There was no international rules or managing small arms. We didn't even know how many there were. In 1999, when we first started talking about this issue, we just made it up and told the United Nations, we think there are probably about, I don't know, 500 million guns in the world. We had no idea. And even today, I think we're still playing catch up to try and figure out where are they. I joined an organization after that called the Small Arms Survey. Uh, and this was an organization dedicated to mapping out for the first time ever the entirety of the world's arms, the small arms trade. To really understand how many guns were there in the world. Where did they come from? Who was producing them? Who was trading them? What were their impacts? How many people were dying? How many people were being injured? And we put together over the course of a couple of years uh, a compendium of all of the data and information. We did it because we wanted to create an, an international treaty that would actually, for the first time, uh, set standards and rules and conditions for how do you sell weapons to different countries. You know, 20 years after starting this journey, in 2013-14, in the arms trade treaty actually came to fruition. Can you do like top five bizarre things in US? So number one, uh, they elected an orange haired orangutan. They lost a war to Canada. Which is kind of funny. The vast majority of Americans believe in creationism. Their chief religion, Mormonism, starts the principle that you have golden underwear, and that's like the, the, the most valuable symbolic element of the Mormon faith. Really? Yeah, at a certain stage in Mormonism, you're allowed to wear golden underwear. <laughs> uh, number five is that you can buy guns in Kmart and Walmart. Uh, it's, it's, it's crazy. You still can today? You still can today. With in, all the shootings? In virtually every state. If you go into the United States, you enter a bizarro world where essentially facts no longer matter. There is a, a proportion, a certain segment of the population that honestly believe that having guns in the home will actually reduce the likelihood of them being a victim of crime and in some kind of wild western way <laughs> will allow them to defend other poor, you know, good people, people of good people. 90% of the research and more suggests that if you got a gun in the home, you're more likely to kill your spouse or your partner or yourself in the heat of a moment or by accident. In fact, in the United States, you're 14 times more likely to die of your own gun if you've got a gun in your home. I mean, it's just it's sort of a fact. It's got even more people dying of suicide. More people are dying from toddlers, little kids killing their parents or their brothers. And yet, and yet, they still can't get responsible gun control. And it defies all evidence, it defies all of the science. Five interesting facts about Canada. Uh, the whole country is not always cold. Our national animal is a beaver. If any of you have seen a beaver before, it's sort of like a fat rat with a flat tail. We almost always apologize for everything. And I'm sorry for having to say that. <laughs> 
sorry. Bless you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Number four. Um, My dog is trying to break into the interview. This is new. This is new. It could be a Canadian dog. We're really yeah. friendly people. Number five, we also, we're a huge country. Okay. We're the second largest country by landmass in the world with a tiny little population. We're about oh, a little bit over one-tenth of the population I, of Brazil. I think you forgot one of the most interesting facts in Canada, that classic scene from Michael Moore's movie. Oh, yeah. You don't lock doors. Yeah, this is true. So in, in growing up, in, in where I grew up in, in Ottawa, my memories growing up in the 70s and 80s, was essentially of having doors open all the time, of, of being able to walk without any fear of any anxiety, because it's a place where people honestly, I think, care, where people honestly are looking out for each other. So the idea of having open doors, I think was also a function that neighbors would watch their neighbors. Yeah. But there was a sense of, of a kind of common community, uh, and that's very special. I think you really need that if you want to deal with things like crime and violence, including here in Brazil. Brazil, is the world's fourth largest producer, manufacturer of small arms, light weapons, and ammunition, and exports everywhere. Not just the United States, or to Spain, or to Portugal, or Germany, but to Zimbabwe, to Bangladesh, to Saudi Arabia, to some hot spots around the world, including war zones. Uh, and every year, we think about 500,000 people are killed by gunshots every single year around the world. And Brazil is the number one in the world. Uh, and so Brazil, in 2000, 2004, collected more guns in the course of, I think, six months than anywhere else in the world. I remember on that film, I think it's Jackie Brown, one of Tarantino's films, there was a scene on some character watching on TV, girls with bikinis, big tits, and machine guns. Can you talk a little, a little bit about the gun culture? There are a few tools in our society, a few instruments that I think endow the user with that kind of force. Gun culture, I think, is it's something that it's pervasive. It's not just in you know, Afghanistan or in Yemen. I think the United States is one of the most formidable gun cultures in the world. The technology around guns hasn't actually changed that much. What's changed is the look. You know, they become kind of fashion, fashionable, right? Hot pink or, you know, cool lines or, but actually a lot of those come from science fiction. You know, from Flash Gordon to Star Wars to, you know, whatever the current one is today. A lot of those come from movies. I mean, the gun industry responds to people's likes and dislikes. So I think it starts when you're really young. My father had a couple of guns in the house, uh, like old 22s, and they sat there on the roof. They were kind of part of the house. There was a certain pride that my father had in making sure the gun was reasonably well looked after. There's a huge amount of respect. And then you go up to the next level where it's become, I think, increasingly part of a hyper-masculinity in our society. Dominant sort of idea of the authority, you know, the authority in society. And the guns play into that. They reinforce it. And for those who don't have that power, a gun sort of like endows them with that power. And then on top of that, I think we have the fear in our societies. There's this idea of the reinforcing of fear within our cities, within our inner cities, in our neighborhoods, and as you said, within particular groups of our society. And I think guns and the gun manufacturing industry has played to that. It's all about self-defense. It's all about being able to defend your wife and your children. There's been a whole shift in the last couple of decades to try to market towards women, but it's really about reinforcing that masculine image, that image of defending one's home, defending one's family. What's remarkable to me, whether I'm working in the highlands of Papua New Guinea or in, in parts of Yemen and Afghanistan, or whether it's in like Kentucky and Mississippi, or Hosinia, or Hosinia, the culture around gun ownership, it's the same. It's not like it's, you know, this is a, 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 what we call a transversal factor. We see it across time and space in the same ways. Can you tell a brief story about Robert Muga? Uh, I grew up in, in one of the most peaceful uh, countries on the planet, but the paradox of growing up in Canada in the 1970s and 80s, we were all pretty convinced we were all going to die in some horrible nuclear holocaust. In 1984, there was this movie that came out called The Day After, and that was sort of seared on my brain. It reminded us just how precarious our world was. And when I was about 18, 19, I took off to Africa. Africa to me turned my whole world upside down. Welcome to reality. But it taught me about reality. It taught me that actually the majority world, the vast majority of the world, was living in a very different kind of set of existences than, than I was. Horrible, prolonged wars. Millions of refugees coming across the borders. And that, in a way, transformed me utterly. And then from there I moved to, to East Africa and worked in Kenya and Somalia. And that's where I got involved in the arms trade. And I, I was there during the Rwandan genocide, which was a searing experience again for all of us. They had a killing ratio that was in fact five times faster than the, that for the chambers during the Holocaust. Is there any good documentary or any good film about this genocide? There was Hotel Rwanda, which I think was 
uh, I think one of the latest movies that came out. There was, I think, a wonderful book called Shaking Hands with the Devil, the, the general in charge of the peacekeeping mission. And he was seeing that this was a planned genocide. This didn't happen randomly. I, I stopped being the idealistic student and started to really try to understand the underworld of the arms trade. Because everywhere I went, East Africa and West Africa, then later to Sri Lanka, over to Papua New Guinea and Timor, everywhere I went, there were guns. So in the course of all this work, uh, I came across Brazil. In 2003-2004, was going through a, a rather extraordinary process of disarmament statue uh, and an arms collection program. The woman who was running that campaign was a woman in Los Angeles. I fell instantly in love with her. Here's this woman who was actually doing what it was that I'd been researching and studying for years. How could I resist? <laughs> so I love story. And so now we live in Rio and we set up the Igarpe Institute, the Instituto Igarpe in 2011. And Ilona it's uh, one of the writers of Quebrando Tabu. Instituto Igarapé support every time that we need data for the channel. We call them because we know they're serious. How, can you tell me about your experience in Afghanistan and Iraqi? So I was brought in by the United Nations and others to do assessments uh, to really try to figure out uh, and do mappings in these countries of how many guns were there, who had them, how do you... That was during the war or right just, after? Just after. A big challenge was what to do with the ex-army and how to essentially demobilize them, disarm them, and then reintegrate them into society. Uh, and how do you essentially rebuild them and, and, and rebuild trust with communities to take them back? The big challenge is, first of all, finding out where are they? You know, where are their guns? What kind of guns have they got? What kind of market exists to absorb them? What is the worst image that you saw or the worst emotion you felt in the war zones? There's so many, you know. I, I remember one incident, for example, in the Congo, and I was in Brazzaville um, basically doing what's called a verbal autopsy. I was trying to figure out how many people died. In any war zone, one of the hardest things to do is to figure out who died, where do they die, because often the hospitals don't work, there are no morgues, uh, the body is essentially decomposing, uh, there's nobody keeping tabs of them. So the way you do that is you ask questions. You have to ask people, how many people died in your household uh, in the last six months? If they died, what do they die of? And then you got to figure out, how old were they? Where do they die? If you want to prosecute you know, leaders, warlords, you need to know what happened. Otherwise, it's all missed. And so I remember I was interviewing a bunch of warlords. So they had crazy names, like you know, Colonel Peanut Butter, or you know, Mr. Superman, or Mr. Ding Dong. And they would describe how they would um, kill people, how they would you know, do unspeakable things, cut open people's bodies, and pull, out, you know, pull out the body, pull out the fetus, how they would eat the, the, the body parts of the victims. Consuming your opponent, literally, is a way of also ensuring that their spirit doesn't come back to haunt you. It's, it's, it serves a metaphorical function to your enemy as well. It, it tells your enemy you're really serious. But then at the end of it, he laughed and said, you know, on the weekends, we all go across the river uh, to Kinshasa, which is the capital of Congo. And we party with the guys we're fighting against. We do lines of coke together. Uh, we drink whiskey together. But on the Monday, we come back and we fight again. And the war fighting begins. Then you see that a lot of war, there's a logic, a crazy logic, but there's a logic to it. There's a rationale to it. War isn't stupid. It's insane. It can be crazy. It can be destructive. You, you know, it's easy to become numb when you do this kind of work, whether you're a you know, journalist, or whether you're a researcher, or whether you're an, an aid worker, or a practitioner. But you also have to remember to kind of maintain your empathy. I mean, uh, you have to maintain your connection, to the human contact, and that's really hard to do. Last question, because you gotta go. Yeah. Can you talk about your collaboration with CIA? Well, you know I'm Canadian, so we don't have CIA. We have CSIS. And if I told you, I'd have to kiss you. So. <laughs> <laughs> It was a pleasure being with you. <laughs> Gente, espero que vocês tenham gostado desse episódio. Aqui tem os episódios da semana passada. Se você gostou, por favor, comente. É, dá uma comentada no blog da Folha. Esse canal agora faz parte de um blog da Folha chamado Grossa e Andrade. Muito obrigado mesmo a toda a equipe que participa desse canal, faz ele acontecer. Obrigado por todo mundo que está comentando. E é isso, é nóis, valeu. Até semana que vem.